Hi, this is Margaret Bird and welcome to Color Quest and welcome to the incredible city of Puebla, Mexico. I am traveling on the last three weeks of an artist residency that has taken me from the Andes of Peru and now to this beautiful area of central Mexico. If you've been following along, you know that I had some incredible weeks in the area of Chinchero and Urubamba, Peru, where I studied with a local dye master, looking at plants that are used there for natural color. Here, I'm going to be continuing my study, but on my own. And so I will be looking at all different kinds of dyes that I am inspired by while here. It's only been a few days and I immediately was excited to see at least four different dye plants right in my residency garden. So today on Color Quest, I'd like to walk you through the garden and we'll look at a few of those plants, some of which I've already looked at here on Color Quest and maybe throw them into a dye pot to see what these particular local plants will bring to us in the way of natural color. So join me now as we walk through the garden. So going from a more rural residency into an urban residency has been a bit of a shift. The residency of Architopia is housed in this incredible space that has beautiful areas for being able to work in a studio space as well as just simply enjoying the garden. So I'm going to walk you through right now so you can see just how special the space this is. So I am on the middle floor here. There's actually four floors that house different studio spaces, but you can see the courtyard area of this building is filled with all kinds of plants. So I'm going to be exploring to see what I might be able to sample here in the way of natural color. So let's walk down there into the garden now and I can show you a few things that I have already identified and really excited to put them into the dye pot. So number one on the list is hibiscus. So this plant has the red flower and I've had a few videos here about hibiscus, but I'm going to pluck these right from the plant itself and put them into the dye pot and you can see I will take some of the petals and flowers that have already started to fade. Now this one I was poking around and I found that there is an aloe plant. I had a trip where I did some foraging in a garden in Aruba and aloe was one of those plants and like hibiscus Aloe is also pH sensitive, so it creates a really unique color. And then you have the wonderful pleasure of being able to shift its color with a pH shift. Now over here, the beautiful bougainvillea. I have dyed with bougainvillea using fiber, but I've also made ink. so. I will definitely be sampling from this. Maybe we'll put it back into the dye pot and see what these red blooms will bring us. 
So many of these plants are similar to what I worked with in Aruba, as well as plants that I have in my California garden. So it'll be fun to sample from them and see what this particular climate might bring to us in terms of the colors that they provide in the dye pot. So the first one I'm gonna work with today is gonna be with hibiscus. I've already collected quite a few of, of the fallen flowers. So let's get those in the dye pot and start working on that. So I'm going to show you the dye studio. It's very small, has a few things that I can use in order to make some dye, but I just grabbed the pot that I'm going to use. And I want to show it to you because it'll give you a little hint of what I'm going to work on probably in another video soon here on Color Quest. It's an aluminum pot, just like I was using in Peru. But as you can see, this was definitely used for indigo lovingly known as anil here in Mexico. So I'm gonna have to rinse this out pretty well. It's got quite a bit of residue in it, as well as whatever the reducing agent was in the bottom. So we'll get that cleaned up and then we'll get that hibiscus dye going. Okay, so this pot's gonna have to keep its status as indigo but I found another pot so we'll fill that one up and use this so here is the little kitchen studio that I get to use while I'm here they only have electric and since I'm really gonna be able to use just one pot at a time, that's all good. I got two hot plates, got one turned on. It's almost like being back at home. Can feel the warmth coming on here. It's a pretty big pot I have. So hopefully it will heat it up. And with hibiscus, I'm gonna be back to watching my heat a little bit. So not too concerned. Can you hear it working, doing it sizzling. All right, this, this is a good lesson in you work with what you have and you just kind of wing it and see what happens. So the hot plate that was here wasn't really producing much heat. So I actually added another hot plate, which has no control. It's just an on or an off type thing. So I actually ended up getting the hibiscus to a boil, which at home I never would do. After Peru, I would maybe be more willing to try that. And the color is not like anything I've ever seen before. So let me show you what is brewing right now in this hibiscus dye pot. So here's my setup. This is the other hot plate just to get it some more heat. This guy's just not giving out enough to get this going, but it came out and it was actually boiling. Now the color is an interesting sort of amber brown, which could be any number of reasons for that. And this pot, I've never used it before. It definitely has been used. I can tell by the ring, it's also been used for indigo. And with indigo, you take it up to very high alkalinity. So if this pot has any residual calx in it, which I'm gonna guess it does, it would obviously impact the pH of the pot. I have litmus paper, I might test that out. That could probably give me an idea. A hibiscus kind of moving into a greenish goldish color would indicate to me that this is an alkaline bath. So, don't know. And honestly, it doesn't really matter. It's just kind of fun to grab these plants and try them out. But also shows you how many different things can impact a result. I have brought wool with me from Peru. So I put that into a skein. I've had it soaking so that it can be wet and I'm gonna introduce it into the dye pot now. And we will let that go about its biz and see what color we get. Uh, it's definitely gonna be in the gold green realm. So I might go grab my litmus paper and see what we got on pH. 
Oh my God, yeah. Look at that. It's a total alkaline bath. Oh, it's a nine. That is an alkaline bath. So we are definitely with some kind of residual alkaline in that bath that was used for indigo. So that's okay. It's gonna shift the color, that's what happens. We know that hibiscus is pH sensitive. And so, yay, we're just gonna get that color. And I may have to think about getting a neutral pot for some of my other tests, unless we just go all alkaline all day long. Okay, I'm smiling here because I'm also realizing how much of an impact being in Peru for so long had on my dye practice. Now, I put that wool in. I didn't mordant that wool. So, in honor of Maria, I'm going to do a little in-pot mordant. I'm going to add some alum and I'm gonna add some cream of tartar. Both of them fall in the acidic spectrum. I don't think they're gonna bring that color back into anywhere in the realm of pink or red, but it, should give a little bit more oomph in order for that wool to absorb some of that color. So I'm just gonna splash it in, I'm not gonna measure it. Thanks, Maria. And we'll let that sit for like an hour and see what that wool ends up taking up from that bath. All right, let's add a little bit of each, a little bit of balm, a little bit of cream of tartar, see what happens. This is really just like some alchemy going on here. How much? Um, and just a hint of cream of tartar. Stir that around and maybe that will give a little mordant help. I don't know, that might have made it a little more brownish <laughs> this is really like stew oh my gosh how much fun is this all right the wool has been in there for about an hour i just turned it off and i'm just gonna let it sit and cool in the pot here's the wool it has a green cast to it kind of hard to see in the camera i'll let this cool so this alkaline resulted bath thanks to a contaminated pot is gonna be the result, but that's cool. All right, let that sit and we'll move on to our next plant. All right, next day I've let it soak overnight and it's a very neutral color. It had a green tint to it, but now I think it's pretty much just a nice, lovely neutral brown. But I went out and got myself a pot. So I thought, there were a few more flower petals that I could grab, so I just put some in the pot. I'm gonna go put it on the stove and not let it boil and see if this neutral pot might bring about a different color. So let's go put it on the stove and see what happens. So what do I always say about expectations? Just don't do it. <laughs> don't have them. I had some expectation and when I just walked in to check on the hibiscus dye, the color was not what I thought it was going to be. And that's okay. Now the pot I bought, I don't know anything about. I think it's an enamel pot. Should be completely neutral. I went ahead and tested the pH and it is actually neutral. So I guess this is just the color that these hibiscus are going to share with me and I want to show it to you. So it has like a purple cast to it. When I first looked at it, I thought that it was even blue, but it is more purpley. So I'm going to put another wool skein in, add a little in the pot mordant with alum and some cream of tartar just to do a little brightening for the wool and We'll see what we get as a second attempt with hibiscus. Oh, 
All right, so while that second pot of hibiscus is brewing up with the wool, I thought we could move on to collecting the next flower, and that's going to be bougainvillea. Now, if you've watched the videos here on Color Quest about bougainvillea, you will know that the first step that I want to do with this is to collect the flowers and then start a slow process of mashing them. And that is to slowly extract the color from the flower itself. So I'm gonna grab some of these red bougainvillea and start that mashing process. Okay, now I'm gonna go through the process of separating out the three flower petals from that centerpiece and I'll remove those. That takes a little bit of time, I'll work on that, and then we'll start mashing them up. All right, so I separated the petals, come here. Now I'm gonna do the mashing portion. Now, when I was in Aruba, I tried both heating and a solar dye with these and I preferred the result of the solar. So since I only have one pot and I have a few other things I wanna dye, I thought we'll make a solar dye out of these, but I'm gonna help with that process by beginning to break down the fiber of the flower and have the color start to emerge. Once we do that, we can just put our fiber right into a glass jar and put that out in the sun. We've got plenty of it here. I'll let that sit for a few days. We'll come back to it and see what happens. Now for the wool, I am going to go ahead and pre-mordant it. I'll just make up a quick bath of alum and throw that wool in, let it cool in the pot for like an hour. That'll give it enough mordant quality, I think, to help with the bougainvillea. The bougainvillea is a beautifully bright color. In terms of its light fastness or ability to stick around, I do have some pieces that I still have from Aruba from almost two years ago, but I think it's probably just based on the color. It's gonna be pretty sensitive to things. I wanna give that wool a little bit of extra something something with the mordant, so let's do that. Okay, you can see I got that going, got some of that red started. I'm gonna go let this sit for some time in the sun and let the sun work a little magic and then I'll do a little more squeezing. I'll probably add some more so I have a little bit more volume. All right, day three now. I have had the bougainvillea sitting out for two days in the sun. I'm gonna leave it in overnight tonight and I'll pull it out tomorrow. Quick look at how it's looking. You can see it's definitely picking up the color. I've got the silk, cotton, and then the wool, all very different. But we'll let that sit for another night. I pulled out the wool from the second batch of hibiscus and I really love the color. And now, it's time to cut some aloe. That will be the third plant from this week's video. Let's go get some aloe. All right, we don't need very much. I'm not making a very big pot, as you know, so I found a smaller plant here. So I'll just take one or two small fronds from that, cut them up, put them into the pot, and we'll start cooking them up. I'm gonna cut from this guy. He's kind of hidden back in here. We'll just cut a piece or two. Oh, there's a little snail friend. Don't want to bother him. This is his habitat. 
So maybe I'll head over here and work on this one. I think this should suffice. Maybe I'll cut one more. When you first see an aloe cut, it's just so pretty. And then this is what's gonna change color so drastically. So we'll cut that up. And believe it or not, we are gonna be getting ourselves a beautiful pink color from this beautiful green plant. I took the aloe off the stove and decided to put it out into the sun next to the bougainvillea. So the bougainvillea has been in there for gosh about three days now almost and the aloe had a good at least hour or two on the stove and now sitting in the sun for a few hours so I'm going to take them both out rinse them, hang them, and then we've got our four dyes all from the garden here in Papa. Really different hues depending upon what the fiber was. So, really pretty. Okay, the three garden plants and their fiber dyes are all done, dried, and ready to share with you. I can tell you that there were some surprises and also it's a really pretty, very soft palette. So check it out. First attempt at the red hibiscus is this. It turned into a really lovely sort of greenish yellow color and it was definitely in a pot that had an alkaline residue. So here is the second attempt and this is with a neutral pot and I did not expect to get this beautiful green. It's a really lovely almost like mint green and you can see the two next to each other. Now here's the silk. Interestingly enough you can see a little bit of purple there, which as you know, is the color of the dye itself. So I'm guessing that I probably spilled something on this. Like I'm going to guess something acidic that brought that purple back. Uh, I do have some different acids and bases on my workspace, so it's possible. But that was definitely the color of the dye and this is the result. And you can see both on hemp and on cotton these were treated with aluminum acetate again very light but very pretty green so there's that first batch the bougainvillea now this was probably the biggest surprise to be honest with you so this was done solar so three days sitting in the sun here you can see that i left it in with the flowers themselves and so i did not get a straight dye it actually has variation in color you can see these are a little bit more orange and then when i rinsed it it was just so bright yellow i was super surprised by that the wool itself was treated with alum i knew that being able to attach bougainvillea might have been a little bit of a stretch for fiber but i did not expect yellow now the silk super light i expected that to be a little bit darker and it's a very, very light pink. And then the hemp and the cotton, both light. The hemp did a little bit better, a little bit more of that pinkish color. But 
the wool really surprised me. I mean, wow. When I rinsed that and it was this yellow, I was super surprised. The last one. So this was the aloe. I have worked with aloe once before and I got some variations. I actually shifted in the past to get more of this orangish color, but I didn't bother doing it this time. I really loved the color that came just from the neutral aloe. It was different than what I had experienced when I was in Aruba. Again, plants are always different no matter where they are. So it can be so much influence the soil, the time of year, all that stuff. So this is the silk piece, beautiful, rich, almost like a rust color, really, really pretty and picked it up very nicely. And then our cellulose pieces took it also quite nicely. So those are really, again, pretty. I really love how the wool turned out. I thought that was a really lovely color. So let me show them all together now. Here is the wool palette from my garden here in Puebla. Beautiful, soft, muted colors, really lovely. And then here it is in silk. And here it is in two different kinds of cellulose. So I think it's a really, really pretty combination and such a great way for me to start off my time here. So what a great way to start my first week here in Puebla, just enjoying the garden and seeing what beautiful color, just hidden and not so hidden in some of these plants. I think the lesson learned here that I would like to share is that have very few expectations or limit your expectations and know that if you tried one dye source from one location, you could get a completely different color another time that you try it out. Hibiscus, it definitely <laughs> surprised me. And certainly the bougainvillea bringing about such a rich yellow was also very surprising from that red, red flower. So next week on Color Quest, I am, as you might imagine, wildly inspired by the plants in this garden and particularly the leaves. Now, I worked on doing some echo printing while I was in Peru because of the leaves down there. And now in this garden, there are just some huge, beautifully shaped leaves that I don't have where I live. So I think we should play around with some echo prints next week. So have a wonderful week wherever you are. I hope you get a chance to get into your dye studio soon. And I look forward to seeing you in Puebla, Mexico next Friday.